Last Sunday morning, I worked hard in my lesson to get over the fact that truth is absolute and objective. And we talked about there's no middle ground between truth and error. The Bible is the Word of God, or the Bible is not the Word of God. The baptism of the Great Commission is for the remission of sins, or the baptism of the Great Commission is not for the remission of sins. That is the very nature of truth. There's no shadows in between. It's just what it is. Now this morning we talked about the business of the straight and narrow way. That it's hemmed in on all sides by the authoritative will of God. And that people who want to enter the way to heaven must be willing to set aside their desires and their will and submit to the teaching of the Bible, the gospel, the plan of salvation. And once having entered in, they live as the New Testament teaches them to live. There are only two ways that are in this world, and all of us are in one of the two. The broad way that leads to eternal damnation at the end of the world, the narrow way of truth and righteousness that leads to eternal life. And that, when it comes to what the Lord's church actually is, and we carry out the Great Commission, we ought to be interested in setting it out that plain and that clear for all to understand because all around us, everything is blue, blacks and grays and everything in between. But that's not the way it is when it comes to truth. The American Standard Version, 1901, renders the following verse, Ephes or verses, Ephesians 5, 15, 16, as follows. Look, therefore, carefully how you walk. King James says circumspectly, meaning look all around the whole circumference as you are examining things to see whether you're right, you're, what you ought to be with God. So look, therefore, carefully how you walk, how you live, how you conduct your life, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, buying it back, purchasing it back to use for God, because the days are evil. The devil dominates this world. How we walk or conduct ourselves either bring, brings glory to God or shame upon the cause of Christ. And all of us have an influence. And it's either a good influence, the manner in which we live, or it's a bad influence. This is not only true of every Christian, every single Christian, individual Christian, but it's true of the congregations of the Lord's people. The direction that the elders of a congregation decide for the church to take and all faithful members of the church and all that faithfulness and members of the church means will mean that we will want to choose what we said this morning was a straight and narrow way. And last week would be the way of truth and not error. So as the influence of an individual Christian can either bring glory or shame upon the cause of Christ, so can a congregation. All you have to do is read in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible of the seven churches of Asia, to see how each one of those had a reputation because of the way the people were living. So it's very important that we do not send uncertain sounds by the way that a congregation conducts itself out to the brotherhood or to those not members of the church. So keeping in mind what we studied, most everybody's here, if not everybody that heard last week's sermon and this morning's sermon, then let's plug this one into it because this has to do with what we, we meaning the church here at Spring, individual Christians who make it up that are faithful to the Lord, what we do not want to be known for what we do not want to be known for. So there are many things we don't want to be known for. 
And one of those things that the faithful members here, certainly the elders, is known for tolerating, putting up with error. The spiritual bride of Christ was purchased by the blood of Christ, Acts 20, 28. We all became Christians because we obeyed the gospel. And obedience to the gospel means turning away from a practiced habitual life of sin and turning to, for the rest of our lives, however short or long they may be, to know and live as close to the truth of the New Testament as is possible. That's why we're called saints. And that's how you are holy, is to live according to the truth. Holy means that you're dedicated to one cause. And as far as the church is concerned, that means to please God, though it may not please anybody else. So there are many uh, things we do not want to be known for that, Many churches claiming to be followers of Christ, claiming to believe in the Bible, seemingly do not have a problem with. We do not, this is the first one, and basically I'll be giving you a list because each one of these could be turned into a study. So the first one I'll begin with is we don't want to be known as a congregation that supports any kind of error that would cause us to loose people from what God in the New Testament has bound upon us. Where God restricts in his word, then that should content us with restricting the same and not being more strict than he is. On the other hand, where he looses us and allows us to do things, then we don't want to say, no, you can't do those things uh, because you'll sin. No, you won't. If you do only what's authorized by the words of the New Testament, Colossians 3.17, you'll be as you ought to be. Uh, Paul pointed this out, and I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Well, of course, he's talking about in matters that are imperative to becoming a Christian and living the Christian life. It doesn't mean that, well, uh, uh, most of the church likes boiled okra, so everybody's going to like boiled okra or they're sinning. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about things God requires of us to believe and to obey, obligatory things that we might be saved. So we ought to speak the same thing in those matters. He says that there be no divisions among you. Well, again, he's talking about an obligatory thing. Even Paul and Barnabas had a difference between them as to whether they should take John Mark or not take John Mark on the second missionary journey. Nothing ever said in the Bible about both those men disagreeing over whether or not to take him. It was sinful. In fact, two missionary journeys turned out on it. Paul took Silas and went back where they had gone on the first missionary journey. Barnabas took John Mark and went to Cyprus. No indication they all fell out one another. In fact, the church there commended both efforts. No sin involved. Paul just thought that it was better to not take John because he left them on the first journey. There are always going to be things like that in the church. There will be things like that in your own family. So you need to know what's obligatory in becoming a Christian, what's obligatory on you in living the Christian life, and be content to abide by those things. And that's how we have the unity for which Christ prayed, John 17, and which Paul commanded to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.10. So we want to be known as a Christian, as a church that abides by the authority of Christ, whether it's uh, what's bound or what's loosed. And we do not want to tolerate that Uh, which is wrong, whether it's bound or loosed, where it shouldn't be. We don't want to be known as a congregation that accepts unscriptural divorces and and marriages, remarriages. I don't know why we can't see when we read Matthew 19, 6, or uh, just exactly what God thinks about the matter. And he's quoting what took place back over in Genesis when God first instituted marriage. Verse 6 says, Plainly, in Matthew 19, 6, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God joined together and that lot man put asunder. So it's very obvious then that God joins two together who are eligible before God to become husband and wife. And in this day and time, we never thought 
At one time, we would have to say this. That's talking about a male joined to a female and a female to a male. Nobody else has authority from God to contract a marriage. I don't care what the United States Congress says. You can't change God's law. It's a male and a female. In fact, Jesus began here by pointing out in verse 4, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Well, I would say it like this. Yeah, people have read it. They don't believe it. <laughs> they don't think it's authoritative. But that's going to read that way on the day when they stand before Christ in judgment. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain or two shall be one flesh. And that's just the way it is. And I don't care whether you've been baptized into Christ or not. You cannot have marriages contrary to the teaching of the Bible and expect to be faithful to God and faithful brethren to receive you in full fellowship. It just won't work. And when we're out studying with people who are not members of the church, we need to study closely what the Bible teaches on marriage, divorce, remarriage, because look exactly how the world around about us treats it. So many of them don't even think about getting married. Then you got male to male, female to female, and it to the other, whatever it is. But rarely do you have people saying, this is the way. Remember truth we talked about last week? So we want to be concerned about that. And then there's verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. People wink at that nowadays. It's no shame for people to engage in this kind of thing, divorce, remarriage, many times they won't. But the only reason, there are two reasons a marriage can end, the death of one spouse and one committing fornication and then being put away by the faithful spouse because of the fornication. It's that way. That's what the Bible says. And I'm not going to attempt to change it. And the congregation should not want to be known as one that has all that going on in it. Another is that we don't want to be known as a congregation that always uh, nitpicks one another to death. What in the world do I mean by that? Well, you know, nitpicking means uh, the eggs of lice. And years ago, people had lots of trouble with that. And they actually had people who would take their those old powdered wigs and stuff and because lice would be there, they'd actually sit there and pick them out for them. But it became known as just trying to find fault with anything to everybody. Folks, you can sit here with the people in this room, and if you want to nitpick and find fault, you can do it. But there's a far cry from that and people who are actually in sin, violating God's will, and need to repent. That's a different story indeed, and the Bible directs us how to conduct ourselves along that line. So we find let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 31 through 32. I think I can say this after well over 50 years of preaching and working with people all over the place, members of the church, churches, that there's been as much trouble caused in the churches over people hating one another as they have false doctrine outright taught. Well, you could be engaged in various kinds of false worship and then uh, be engaged in. Having malice toward your brother, well, you're all going to end up in the same place of torment because the Bible doesn't condone any of it. We don't want to be known as a congregation that adheres to the philosophy that one doesn't have to understand that baptism is for the remission of sins in order for it to be scriptural. We've had brethren do that kind of thing. Say that, well, if a person means to obey God, he doesn't have to understand at the point of his baptism that it is immersed in water for the remission of sins. There's been a number of brethren, and especially it happened back in the 19th century, but it's happened even today. There were debates on it back in the 19th century. You may not know it, but some of you, though this paper is no longer published, but it was one of the main papers back for years and years that when the firm foundation started, 
it started basically to combat the idea that, well, if you are baptized to obey God, even though you didn't think about it that moment was when your sins were remitted or forgiven, that's all right. And they had debates on that. Well, even in our time, and this man's only been dead a few years, and quite a popular preacher, and a tremendous in his ability as a, a preacher, as a, we would call him a pulpiteer, as to how eloquent he was, Jimmy Allen, taught for years and years at, at Harding, and he took the position that, well, you don't have to know baptisms for the remission of sins, under the remission of sins, just so you're, at the time, you know you're obeying God. Well, he's only probably the bigger name among people that held that view, but they did. On the day when the church started, Acts 2, verse 38, and answered the men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, they were interested in being forgiven of sins. As believers, Peter took them and said, Repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ to obey God. <laughs> That's not what it says. They were obeying God, of course. But they had to know they were being baptized so their sins would be forgiven for the remission of sins. Period. And thus, I've run across it all my life. People who knew they were immersed in water and they had in mind they were obeying God, but they thought they were saved the moment they believed. They were being baptized for some other reason. They thought it was obeying God, but they thought they were already a Christian when they were baptized. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches about the matter. It's wrong. It's error. It's not the truth. And we don't want to be known as a congregation that views mechanical instrumental music and worship as a non-salvation issue. We've got a lot of brethren in recent years who have said that's just our tradition. Nothing really wrong with it, but if it offends your conscience because we've done it for all these years, that's all right. But don't say the other fellow's wrong. He uses a bagpipe or organ or whatever. The scriptures are clear. Ephesians 5.19, Christians are taught to speak to themselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Then we read uh, over in Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things written there, written in this book. Now, that's either true or it's false. Why even have the New Testament if it's not to teach us God's ways? We don't want to be a congregation that promotes fellowship with the denominational world. Ephesians 5.11 makes it clear and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. When people in the world, whether religious or not, are going contrary to the truth, they're lost in their sins, for all is sinned and comes short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Folks, go back to the New Testament and find me a denomination that's acceptable to God. You can't. They weren't there, as we know denominations today. 1,500 years after the Lord's church was established, Acts chapter 2, did the first Protestant denominations appear. If we're going to have things like God wants them, why don't we just speak as the oracles of God and be what they said? That's the way that's right and can't be wrong. Our duty in the church is to uphold what the church is as it appears on the pages of the New Testament and to follow that as close as we can. We don't want to be known also as a congregation that refuses to uh, discipline children of God that live ungodly lives. That's corrective discipline. We have it as plain as it can be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. Listen, now we command you. Now, does that sound like you can take it or leave it and be acceptable to God? Does that sound like some sort of noble suggestion? Well, no, it's a command. And he says brethren, so he's talking to the brethren. 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, which means by the authority of Christ who purchased the church of which you are a member, who forgave you of your sins when you were baptized into Christ, and thereby the blood was, uh, you contacted his blood. The church that belongs to him, of which he is the only head, and his will is to be done by the spiritual body of Christ, of which you are members in particular. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which you received of us. The tradition that is received from Paul is traditional for the church to do what God tells it. That's the tradition being talked about. It's the tradition of the church to teach the truth of God. It's not the tradition of the church to teach opposite from God or to justify people who don't live according to the teaching of the Bible. Tradition means simply handed down. Well, when you look at 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, Paul said to the young preacher Timothy, the uh, things you've heard of me among many witnesses, of me among many witnesses, the same teach thou to others, that they may teach others also. Commit thou the same to others. That's the tradition. So we also don't want to be known as a congregation that has a preacher that refuses to preach the truth. Now, most of you, haven't been living the life of a preacher. Now by that I mean living with a church that pays your salary, puts food in your mouth and your family's mouth. And then the church starts doing something that you know the Bible doesn't authorize. But you know very well that if you get up and preach about it, as we all joke among ourselves, that's a moving sermon. That's why those sermons won't work. You want to employ or support a preacher who will preach the whole counsel of God regardless of the people in the congregation and what they are and how much money they give and so forth. I don't know why that's such a difficult thing to understand. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. You know, there's no way to preach the word without reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. Think about it for a minute. How would you teach anything out of the New Testament that didn't do one or a combination of those things? Well, you just can't do it. And Paul could say after his work at Ephesus and say it to the Ephesian elders when he called them to Miletus. He said, wherefore I take you to record this day. In other words, you know what I did when I lived among you and preached the truth. That I am pure from the blood of all men. Paul, how can you say that? For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. America says the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, 26 and 27. That must be the desire of people. Uh, it, it, it irritates me to no end and has for a long time to see a bunch of hirelings that pass themselves off as preachers. They're just not going to preach everything, especially when it comes down to them having to go somewhere else. It just won't work. We also want to be known as a congregation that practices pure and undefiled religion. Now, James tells us about that. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Notice that it's not just the individual Christian that can practice pure and undefiled religion. But when you've got a congregation and they're all made up of individual Christians, then the whole church can practice pure and undefiled religion a part of which is to take care of orphans, orphans from orphanos, which means bereft of parents, and widows. People who can't do what their parents would do because their parents aren't doing it, whether they're dead or whether their parents have forsaken them or whatever's happened, or the widow whose husband has died. So the church is expected to have the milk of human kindness and concern for the plight of others, to be involved in that benevolent type of activity because it's a part of pure and undefiled religion. When people won't take care of widows and orphans, they're not practicing pure and undefiled religion. 
Now, it also says a part of that pure and undefiled religion is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Well, read Galatians 5 and the works of the flesh, and you'll see what Christians cannot do and still go to heaven in its worldliness. And you'll see also that people can commit sins of omission, leaving undone what God expects us to do. And so we want to be, in other words, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We are to be ready unto every good work. And we look to the New Testament to tell us what those good works are. It all fits into the category of pure and undefiled religion. We don't want to be known as a congregation that shelters false teachers. I don't know why people say, well, you know, Brother So-and-so, I've known him for years since I was a child, and uh, he's been in this congregation for 30 years or more, and et cetera, et cetera. And he gives well, and he's nice, and he smells good, and he shakes hands well, and he's taught this class for I don't know how long, and been such a fine person, but he's teaching some false doctrine now. But because of emotional ties of long standing, we let him get by with it. I don't want to be a part of a congregation that does that. In Romans 16, 17, now I beseech you, Paul said to the church at Rome, beseech is a very strong word. It means I'm as if I were on bended knee begging you with all I've got in me. Brethren, that tells you who he's talking to. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Can language be clear? I remember back many, many years ago when Al Brown was still here teaching. We hadn't lived here that long. And he would always on Wednesday night take this lectern right here and move it up about midway and teach. And just about two or three benches somewhere along that behind where J.D. Gunner is sitting, there was a fellow who taught false doctrine on marriage, divorce, free marriage. Brother Al had this rather booming baritone voice. He didn't need this very much. And when he had this, it really boomed. <laughs> and he stood there, and I was still getting familiar with the congregation, and this fellow started into what uh, I understood uh, before I ever got here was false doctrine on marriage, divorce, free marriage. And Brother Al was standing there, and he just interrupted him and said, I've told you before, you're not going to teach that false doctrine here. And Jack Stevens and Brenda were visiting here at that time. Jack said at that time, as soon as I heard that, I knew that's the congregation I want to be a part of. Well, it'll draw the people you want to be a part of, and it'll run the rest off, and may they run off if they won't repent. Why do we want people that are just warm bodies to be in the church when they're not converted and all that means to Jesus Christ and determined, as we studied last Sunday morning, to have truth over error and to walk, as we said this morning, the straight and narrow way? Brethren, that's not mean. When Brother Al did that, that was just a sense of relief to me because he had been here a good while. He knew who was who and what was what. But in the next few years, we learned also there were some that were who was who and what was what. But that's the way it's going to have to be in a congregation that chooses to always be right as the Bible defines the right. There are going to be people who will want to link themselves up with you and they expect you to put up with them in their error. The church can't please God and do that. We're the redeemed of the earth. We're the saints of God. We're the holy ones of God. Now, that's not just something we say. That means that's because we believe and act according to the authority of Christ. Moving from that, we don't want to be known as a congregation that refuses to defend the faith. I have been in this congregation a good while, and I've never known that to be a congregation that wouldn't defend the faith. We talked about Jude 3 just recently back here in the auditorium. I say auditorium. It's a class in the back for the adults. And we've noticed that we were exhorted in Jude 3 that we should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once American Standard Version, for all delivered to the saints. That's just a part of, of being a Christian. You know, we have 
you know, our brain is, is geared such is that we don't have to think about I breathe, I exhale. It just does it <laughs> because that's the way it's set up. When it comes to obligatory matters, those things necessary to be faithful to the Lord, that's the way it ought to be. In everything that God enjoins upon us, it ought to be just natural that we do that. But many times people want to say the fellow standing up for the truth and exposing error is the bad guy. And that's the, I've heard people say, oh, we shouldn't debate, that's bad. Well, I've heard a lot of folks shouldn't even be preaching because what they call preaching the truth is not the truth, it's error. Well, if you ask people, well, what makes a debate a discussion, a public discussion of differences between people on what the Bible teaches, what makes that wrong? Tell me how long do you read in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for Jesus either in a semi-public way, in a very public way, was exposing the error among the Jews? What about the forerunner of Christ? What about John the baptizer? He just he spoke to his audience and said, Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Well, that ought to tell us something if we're going to speak as the oracles of God. How far do you go into the epistles of the New Testament before error is confronted and exposed and we're being taught, such as in Jude 3, to stand up and be counted when it comes to the truth and opposing error and upholding the truth? Then there's another one. We don't want to be known as a congregation that refuses to submit to the elders when they're godly elders qualified and they've made decisions in the areas God expects them to make them. What we have in Hebrews 13 is obey them that have the rule over you. And this next word's a foul word in the mind of many. And submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls. I wish my brethren understood, the first of all, the meaning and then the significance of the meaning of submit. Submit means they've decided it, we will do it. It doesn't mean that you agree with every little thing, but it means they've decided and they're the ones in the position to decide it and they're qualified to be in that position and it is a matter that we have before us and they've decided it and we submit. It's that simple. But some people, I'm sad to say, all my life I've watched it in the church. I don't know of anybody uh, that's been faithful and active in the church and hasn't seen this happen in churches. They submit, but their idea is as long as I agree with it. Well, that's not submission. Not submission at all. Let me ask you something. When those uh, Higgins landing boats landed on Normandy, do you think any one of those men was just looking forward to that? And many of them, when those gates dropped, those Germans on those machine guns were pointing right toward them. And there were many of those that never got a man off of them. They shot them down before they ever got off. Well, then why didn't they stay in England? In fact, before they were drafted or when they, before they joined over here, why didn't they all flee somewhere else? Because of it. That's what it takes to be a good soldier when you're commanded to do something. I, years ago when I was with Turley Children's Home, and that is getting quite a ways ago now, there was an elderly man who was in his 90s in those days, and I'm thinking back now over 35 years. And he had given a plot of land for the home, Turley Children's Home, to build a group home on. And uh, I forgot what all was going on, but it, I was supposed to pick him up because they were having some sort of gathering at that home. It was about 30 miles south of Tulsa. And I went by his house and picked him up, had a pretty good little drive, and we had a good visit. You know, people in World War II got talked to quite a bit because just about everybody around me and all over the place had uh, the age of my parents were connected to World War II. But here's a fellow of World War I. Now, my grandfather had been in World War I, but he had never left the United States. He was in the Navy up in the Great Lakes, he and his older brother. Well, this fellow had been in the trenches in France. 
And he was uh, forever gave me an example of what it means to submit, to do something you don't want to do and rather not do, and that might cost you your life. In fact, it could come closer to cost your life than would that you'd save your life. He said there was a river, and there was a footbridge they'd been able to get across it. And the Germans were on the other side with machine guns set up. And he said the sergeant was standing right down where he could shelter himself on the side of the American soldiers. And he was sending the, shoulder, the soldiers across. And said, I was back down the line that had to go across, only one man at a time. And he said, I knew my time was coming. He said, every time one of those soldiers would start across that bridge, he said, about the time he got 20, 30 feet out on the bridge, that German machine gun, oh, said, he wouldn't make it more than two or three steps, and he was gone. And he said, I kept counting the time. I kept getting closer and closer. And he said, I got there, and I said, well, I'm going to start off running this fast thing and running. You can't dodge. <laughs> Because you're on that little bridge. He said, I started running when he sent me up there. And he said, I ran just as fast as I could without falling off. He said, I got about the same spot. He said, I heard that old machine gun. Go, got 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 said, I could hear zip, 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 zip. <laughs> He said, I made it across the first one. He said, they shot my clothes off of me. He said, they're just in ribbons. The time I got over there, but not a bullet hit him. That submit. If you don't ever remember anything else about submit to elders, that's as good as any Greek definition of the word translated submit. It means you do it because it's necessary. It's what you're called on to do. That's what you're trained to do. I think I would rather not have done that. But do you think he looked forward to it? I don't know why, brethren. That, that's just simply saying I want it my way and I'm going to bust up matters if I don't get it or I'm going to leave and go somewhere else. There's a multiplicity of congregations that have had people jump one because they did not want to do what the elders decided to do. It didn't suit them. They violated this, and if they don't repent of it, they'll lose their soul. I don't care how well they preach the rest of the Bible and how well they, they teach it. I'd like to know how many sins Adam and Eve had to commit before they were cut off. We don't want to be known as a congregation that uses human amusements to draw crowds. That's a big thing nowadays. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That doesn't mean the manner or delivery in which the truth is preached. It means the substance of the message. It means the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified, such as 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It means preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and why he had to do that to save our souls and what we owe God, how much he loved us, how much we should love him. We want to be known as a congregation that upholds the truth and loves the wisdom of God, the gospel of Christ. Well, these are 13 points. You could add to it more. But I'd say if you're diligent in all these areas, you're going to be pretty diligent in a lot of other areas you may think of. So, yes, a congregation is known not only by what it does, but also by what it refuses to do. And it may mean that you don't have the largest amount of people there, and it may mean you start off with a bunch like they did when they left Egypt. But you see how many arrived that left Egypt from 20 years old and upward, just to, Or it'll make us realize God means what he says and he says what he means. So may our heart's desire be that of pleasing our Heavenly Father, whether we please anybody else or not. Because that guarantees heaven to be your home, as we talked about this morning in the straight and narrow way. So each one of these subjects could be developed. We could spend a lot more time on it and answer questions on it. But when you put them all together and just list them, that makes us maybe think a little more about what we ought to be. What we ought to be is what God wants us to be. We have no business of being interested in anything what God wants us to be.
And we all all want that for each other. That's the grand fellowship between brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what it means to love one another. And to cause one another to live as the Bible teaches. If you're not a child of God this evening, we've studied what to do to become a Christian. We've studied just exactly when God in his mind is going to say, I forgive your sins, and the Lord adds you to the church. As a child of God, are you living righteously? Are you abiding by the whole counsel of God? If not, then whatever area of your life has been used to rebel against God, then repent of that. Make sure as you review your life that your whole heart's dedicated to God's will and you want to do it. You need to repent of sins and confess them if you've been a child of God. Pray God for forgiveness. And now's the time to make it because you don't know when your end's coming. A man said the other day, I said, well, you know, at nearly 76 in a few days, I don't expect to live a long time. But I said, if you had asked me about how I expected to live when I was 26, I'd have said, I don't know where I'll see 30 or not. So really, at whatever point in time you're living life, you don't know whether you're going to get home this afternoon or not. So you better make it as sure as you can while you have the opportunity. And today is a day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. Thus, if you're subject to the invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.